Welcome back, I'm Steph Kurgis, and with the AP test right around the corner, this video is gonna look at everything you need to know about Japan from the beginning of the course to the end. Let's be honest, Japan will be a heavy hitter in the later time periods, but let's set the stage for what you're going to need to know. Be sure to check out the timeline that's gonna show up down here or stays up up here, which will tell you which time period and units we are focusing on. Now we pick up the course in the year 1200, the era of state building and expanding trade networks. And and Japan is just shifting out of the Heian period, which shared a lot of influence from neighboring China and Korea with an imperial court, an emperor, and a focus on literary and scholarly traditions during the Heian period. Buddhism will take hold in Japan in addition to their own Shinto beliefs. However, by 1200, power shifts away from the emperor and into the hands of local clans and land-owning elites in a feudal system. There will also be this attempted Mongol invasion that won't work because of a typhoon, but in the most simple terms, there is an emperor that's really just a simple figurehead, but the real power rests with the shogun. This type of government was known as the Bakufu. Feudal lords or daimyo oversaw plots of land which were protected by samurais and were farmed by peasants. Samurai was, were highly revered, and they followed a code of Bushido for their actions. This code of Bushido, the way of the warrior, was highly influenced by their own cultural beliefs. Those cultural beliefs being Neo-Confucianism, which is again a blend of Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism, along with their own indigenous religion of Shintoism. Now this period involved warring clans, and there was really no centralized rule by an emperor. This decentralized feudal system will bring us into the next period of our course, the years of 1450 to 1750, the era of large land-based empires and these new maritime empires. Japan will be one of the states that experienced a major shift during this time, but not really until like 1600. This is when Tokugawa shogunate was established and Tokugawa Ieyasu, he will be determined to really just check the power of these local lords, these daimyo. He he claimed ownership of all the lands in Japan and instituted a strict social order based on the social roles of the samurai, the farmer, the artisan, the merchant. Now movement between the classes was forbidden. And while he wasn't the emperor, he sure acted a lot like one. Now the capital was moved to Edo or modern day Tokyo, which marked the beginning of this period of history known as the Edo period. Tokugawa Ieimitsu, a later shogun, began to require the daimyo to live in the capital city of Edo every other year. This was known as alternate attendance. Daimyo would then live several months each year in Edo. Now when the daimyo would return to their land, their family would remain in Edo, which feels a little bit like a hostage situation to ensure that the daimyo stays in line and kind of keeps away from the business of feuding. Something else Japan did that was similar to China during this time was become more isolated. Remember that this is the era where European nations are exploring and discovering new places. Now there was this huge desire for Asian goods and Europeans were trying to find shortcuts to get to those markets with their maritime empires. The Portuguese, the Dutch, the Spanish, the British, the French are all involved in some fashion in the Indian Ocean. And Japan was not having it. As Europeans were pushing conversion to the Catholic beliefs that they were sharing along with their unfair trading practices, Japan just shifted into this isolated state and this extreme, extreme opposition to Western culture in Japan. The national seclusion policy of 1635 prohibited any Europeans from traveling to Japan, outlawed Christianity, and prohibited Japanese from traveling abroad. The only exception to this would be the limited trade with their nearby neighbors of the Chinese and the Dutch. But Japan would not stay isolated forever. And this new young country known as the United States would show up on the scene. As we shift into the next time period of 1750 to 1900, we find the Industrial Revolution catching steam. See what I did there? Catching steam. I'm so lame sometimes, I'm not gonna lie. Which led to Western imperialism impacting most of the world, including Japan. And this is where Japan starts getting a lot more attention in the AP World course and exam description. In the case of imperialism, the imperialist power here was the United States. And in 1853, Commodore Matthew Perry from the United States Navy arrived with four giant steamships with these advanced weapons equipping the ships. As the United States was aware of how China was more open to trade after the Opium Wars, 
Hmm, what an interesting idea. And with the newly acquired lands in California, the United States would have a steady stream of maritime traffic between the West Coast and Asia. Add in this desire for some friendly, diplomatic relations in the region, and just in case there might be some shipwrecks and a place that they could maybe resupply their ships, they really wanted to be friends. Uh, this is more of a bully situation though, where the US forcefully declares their desire to be friends. Plus they were looking for more places to sell their goods and wanted access to their markets. So Matthew Perry came showing off their advanced guns and technology, that they were you know, willing to use to become friends with Japan, along with the presents for the emperor that they brought along, including this model steamship locomotive, a telescope, a telegraph, and a variety of wines and liquors from the West, along with a letter saying that they should open their ports to the United States. I cannot wink. I feel like that was a good one. Should I be over the top? The Americans. Now the Japanese eventually agreed under duress to Perry's demands and they signed the Treaty of Kanagawa in 1854. So as a reminder, just another time within this time period of 1750 to 1900, where Western countries were being imperialistic. Now, partially due to these events, there continued to be a decline in the Tokugawa Shogun who ruled Japan in this feudal period and power shifted back to the emperor. This is known as the Meiji Restoration or the restoring of the emperor. During the Meiji Restoration, there was a variety of reforms that shifted Japan away from this simplistic agricultural decentralized state into a powerful one. But how did they accomplish that? Well, first, feudal lords were asked to give up their domains and within one year of the request, they claimed all those lands and they legally abolished and transferred all of it to the Meiji Unified Central State. The Meiji also tied the idea of the emperor and tied it back to their Shinto beliefs. Legitimizing rule by religious ideas, anyone? Cause that's what's happening here. And they went so far as to replace Buddhism as the national religion and reach back into legendary times where Shinto was more culturally Japanese. And the government also introduced a national education system, a constitution creating an elected parliament called the Diet. Most kids attended this free public school system for at least six years, which was controlled by the government. Students learned about mathematics and reading and also moral training, which really stressed the importance of their duty to the emperor and the country and their families. Additionally, Japan declared all social classes equal, but due to this, samurai lost their kind of elevated status and prestige. Then the government went so far as banning the wearing of samurai swords. And very similar to Peter the Great's efforts to westernize Russia, the Meiji wanted to reform the samurai and to cut off their top knots in favor of a Western style haircuts as they shifted to new jobs and professions, a lot of times within the government. Then they shifted military power away from the samurai class and into this modernized unified military force outfitted with the best of the modern Western weapons. If you wanna know more about this, check out the movie, The Last Samurai with Tom Cruise from 2003. You can learn a whole lot more about this. But anyways, back to reviewing. All of these reforms piggybacked with the major push during the Meiji era for state-driven industrialization and modernization. They built railroads, they built steamships, factories were created, private corporations arose. Industrial families like the Mitsubishi family became quite wealthy and Japan's strength continued to grow. While many across Asia really struggled to industrialize and keep up with the West, Japan was a clear outlier and the Asian leader. Plus with the end of feudalism, people were allowed to choose their own careers and work in these new industries. However, with many farmers forced to leave their lands, many Japanese looked for a better life outside of the Japanese islands. Remember, one of the key concepts of this historical time was major migrations. And as Japanese wages plummeted, many came to Southern California. The most significant location that Japanese laborers migrated to was Hawaii as contract laborers to work on sugar plantations. And if you ever travel to Hawaii, and we love it there, uh, you will notice such a huge influence of Japanese culture. As we enter the final period in our course, 1900 to present, Japan is a key player as we talk about the world wars as well as globalization. By 1904, Russia was pushing into the region of Korea and Japan was not going to allow them into that region. Plus Japan was stronger 
than Russia and had more success industrially. Japan declared war on Russia, the Russo-Japanese War, and won it in 1905, making them the dominant force in East Asia. World War I will begin in 1914 and last till 1918, and there's a good chance you really didn't talk a lot about Japan when you learned about World War I. But they were involved. During the first week of World War I, Japan proposed to Britain that they too would enter World War I if they could have Germany's Pacific territories, which ended up happening after they ended the war and signed the Treaty of Versailles. And like the rest of the world, Japan also suffered the economic depression after World War I. This downturn in previous successes led the idea that Japan could and should continue to expand into Asia using their military might. Plus, let's not forget that Japan is an island or a series of islands, and they needed natural resources. So coupling these two ideas together, Japan expanded in a very militaristic way, specifically into mainland Asia. Japan set its uh, sights on Manchuria, which they conquered, and then they turned it into a Japanese puppet state by 1932. Then they looked at China. Now, Japan started an invasion of China in 1937, which technically is a couple years before World War II begins when Germany invades Poland in 1939. Plus, it marks this awful example of ethnic violence as the Japanese targeted Chinese people and what we learned about the Nanking Massacre. Nanking was the capital of China at this time and fell to the Japanese forces as they expanded their empire. The Japanese generals then ordered the city of Nanking to be destroyed. Much of the city was burned and the Japanese troops launched this campaign of atrocities against civilians, which purposeful targeting of civilians in war is always wrong. This is also known as the rape of Nanking as Japanese soldiers raped at least 20,000 women and girls of all ages. They also butchered an estimated 150,000 male war prisoners and massacred another 50,000 male civilians. When all is said and done, it is estimated that 300,000 Chinese were killed. In 1940, then Japan signed the Tripartite Pact with Germany and Italy as they formed the Axis powers. They advanced on areas in Indochina, which was colonized by the French, who were part of the Allies. This act caused the United States to freeze Japanese assets and embargo their oil. In order to replace embargoed resources and to establish their own economic sphere, the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere, Japan doubled down on their expansionist efforts. Think of this as a Japanese semi-empire that focused on pan-Asian ideals of freedom and independence from those Western colonial powers that had been in the region. On December 7th, 1941, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, which is on the island of Oahu, Hawaii. Japan's motivation for this surprise attack was driven by political goals of expansion, its scarcity of economic resources, and as a response to America's embargo policy. Japan believed it would devastate the Pacific fleet and disrupt shipping lanes as they established the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. Japan was able to set up colonial holdings from really like Western Alaska all the way down to the Solomon Islands. The US was able to reestablish their Navy much quicker than the Japanese expected and eventually turned the tide after the Battle of the Coral Sea and the Battle of Midway, which then they went on to this island hopping strategy during World War II. Eventually, I'm sure in your class, you learned about the devastating end of World War II, which introduced atomic weaponry as these weapons were used on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Japan's surrender was announced by Japanese Emperor Hirohito on August 15th, and they formally signed on September 2nd, 1945, marking the end of World War II. Allied forces led by the United States then occupied Japan as they were disarmed, its empire dismantled, and the empire really shifted to a democracy. Women gained the right to vote in 1945, too. There were years of reconstruction to recover from the damages of the air raids and the nuclear fallout. By the 1950s, a former enemy became a Western ally. Japan began to find its economic footing as a manufacturer of consumer devices and electronics and automobiles. It is known as one of the leading knowledge economies, as we learned about, which means that their industries are based on intellect, and intellectual capital, like from creativity and innovation versus raw materials. This is especially big in regard to the high-tech industries as natural resources can be used up. 
However, there's limitless resources if you're focusing on innovation and our capacity as humans. So for an island with limited resources, Japan has excelled today as a knowledge economy. So there you have it, an overview of Japan from the beginning of the course to the end. So let's break it down fast with the one minute recap. Japan had borrowed from its neighboring cultures and blended it with their own. Buddhism and Neo-Confucianism moved into the area, combined with their own Shinto beliefs. There was feudalism, where they had their daimyo and their samurai and people who worked the lands. Tokugawa shogunate tries to limit this feudal fighting. Also, too many Europeans are coming to Japan, bringing all their Christianity and all their unfair trading practices. Japan decides to isolate and only talks to really the Dutch and the Chinese. Until the United States comes along with Matthew Perry and tries to make friends with them by opening their ports. They agree. Actually, they successfully industrialize. They get super strong and then they become the imperialists themselves. They fight against the Germans in World War I so they can get more colonies. And like everyone else, they struggle during the Great Depression. This leads for them to become more imperialists themselves. They attack Manchuria. They attack the Chinese. We have the terrible instance of the violence in Nanking. They attack Pearl Harbor. They draw the United States into World War II. Atomic bombing surrender, become allies with the West, and they build a knowledge economy. So there you have it. I sure hope you found that was helpful as we reviewed Japan from the beginning of the course to the end. And if you felt like it was, share it with a friend, throw us a like, let us know in the comments below. Subscribe to the channel um, and check out the rest of this series as it comes out as we review region by region. Feel free to share it with a friend to help them prepare for the AP exam. I hope this video helped you learn about yesterday to better understand today so we can all write a better tomorrow. Till next time, keep studying and we'll see you around.